I could stop, but I can't. See, I just did over the last two days, 10 videos. Then I was not planning on doing any today because I had a lot of work to do. But then while I'm doing research for what the work I had to do, I had to sit up here and say, well, I'm going to redo the laws so that you did not know exist, and I'm going to put the current case law in it. And while I'm doing it, I'm, the first one I'm going to focus on is the practice of law. So this is what the state of California and these ignorant, ignorant administrative judges have decided. That the defense of a criminal case necessarily constitutes the practice of law. So when you are defending yourself in a criminal case, you're practicing law. Because only this court, only this court, because only this court has the power, has the power, has the power to admit persons to the practice of law. I want you guys to pay attention to that. Excuse me. They list some cases here. California lists cases saying that they're the only ones who can admit someone to practice law. Really? Well, then I'm sorry. I didn't know the law. Ignorance of law has to be excusable because only the court can admit one to practice law, which means they're the only ones who know the law. Well, I don't know the law. The defendant maintains that a student representation pursuant to the rules is unauthorized practice of law. Excuse me. Even if you have some rules, the court says it's the only one that can admit someone to practice law. Let me do this for you. Where did the court get this power? Go ahead. I, I want to I wanna make sure you guys understand. We're, gonna, we're not going to look at this page because I've already copied and pasted these to this page. We're going to go up to the top because it says only the court in California, the courts are the only ones who have the authority to grant one the right to practice law. We need not enter into a discussion as to whether the practice of law is a right or privilege. Regardless of how the states grant a permission to engage in this occupation is characterized, it is sufficient to say that a person cannot be prevented from practicing except for valid reason. Certainly, the practice of law is not a matter of state grace. You cannot be prevented from practicing law. They got to give a valid reason. Well, their valid reason is we're the only ones who can blah, blah, blah. Regardless of how the state grants permission to engage in this occupation is characterized, it is sufficient to say that a person cannot be prevented from practicing except for valid reason. Guess what? They all repeat the same thing. The court instead stated that it is sufficient to say that a person cannot be prevented, blah, blah, blah. Since Schwer, however, the courts have confirmed that in eligibility from employment in a major sector of the economy implicates a fundamental liability or liberty interest. Okay? Since Schwer, Schwer versus Board of Examiners, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania has stated, we need not enter into a discussion. Why don't you need to enter into the discussion? We're talking about a constitutional right. I'm raising a discussion now. Forget that. You idiots keep saying all kind of stupid things. The most that the Supreme Court has been willing to hold is that certainly the practice of law is not a matter of the state's grace. Interesting. The question of whether the practice of law is a right or a privilege has never been addressed by a clear majority of the Supreme Court. Then it lists Schwer as an example. It says, in support of his argument, the practice of law is a right. And the case is an opposite, a plurality of the court holding. They don't deal with the issue. However, the state powers to license persons to engage in such a profession is not the power to create a privileged class by means of arbitrary tests that exclude components and are competent and fit persons. Ladies and gentlemen, uh-uh. No, 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 no. Pay attention. However, the state's power to license, the state does not have the power to grant license. They never receive that power. Because it's a profession, then they say they have the power to license because it's a profession because people engage in commerce and they make money off of it. So the state can license that. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Just because it's a common right doesn't mean that the state gets to license it even if one wants to make a profession out of it. There's no law that says they get to license it because somebody made a profession out of it if it's a constitutional right. For instance, 
I'm going to make a profession out of becoming a, a, a speaker. And I want to speak on politics. No, I want to speak on religion. No, I want to speak on the law. No, I want to speak on just about everything. No, I want to run a YouTube video. Do you see how the state can't license any of those things because they deal with the freedom of speech? Well, they can't license the practice of law because anyone can practice law. Why? Because ignorance of the law is no excuse. So everyone is required to know the law. Everyone is required to know the law. And so if you want to make a practice of something you're required to do, well, you know, I make a practice out of chewing gum. Oh, no, I make a practice out of walking. I make a practice out of exercising because <laughs> it's something I have the right to do. Okay. Again, it says, respondents seeks to minimize the effect of this language by asserting that it had no apparent significance in Schwer and was there regulated in a footnote. But in Hollinen versus Committee of Board Examiners, they decided something else. Certainly, the practice of law is not a matter of state grace. Oh, Garland, I keep saying, I, I keep saying that wrong. It is Garland. Sorry. Ooh. Board of Examiners, New Mexico Supra footnote. Is there a rational connection between the acts given rise to the revocation of Dr. Flynn's license to practice and his fitness and capacity to practice dentistry? 1958, he was both a dentist and a lawyer. Schwer versus the Board of Examiners, certainly the practice of law is not a matter of state grace. It's not a matter of state grace, and then they list Garland. And then they go on to point out where the character had formerly been is relevant only as it blends to the continuous web of life and tinges on the present texture. Irrespective of whether the practice of law is a right or a privilege, a person cannot be prevented from practicing law except for valid reasons, such practice not being a matter of state grace. Okay, these are the different cases where they continue to decide that, but they cannot, the courts do not have the power to grant one the right to practice law. Look, the right to practice law is not a natural or constitutional right, but it is in the nature of a privilege or franchise. Whoa, who's saying this? Somebody's saying that out of stupidity. However, the right to practice law is not a matter of state grace. We cannot exclude a person from the practice of law for reasons that contravene the due process and equal protection clauses of the United States Constitution. No, you got that all wrong. The reason why the practice of law is not a matter of state grace is because the moment you make it to where you need a license to practice law, then I can now use ignorance of law as a defense. I have every right to do that since you just now said that you are the only ones who can grant license to practice law. See, lawyers are said to be learned, students of law. Well, if they're the only ones who can be learned students of law and who can practice law, and I don't have the right to defend myself, you've just taken away that right. Well, it, it, it is a common occupation because I can help my next friend. However, the right to practice law is not a matter of state grace. We cannot exclude a person from the practice of law. But what they're doing is they're saying, well, we're not excluding you from the practice of law. They want to get technical. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will continue to add the, um, these are the cases that actually have just the phrase that I put in. Okay. I reiterate, 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 reiterate that the practice of law in and of itself is not prohibited by law. Wait, accordingly, the common law doctrine of conflict of interest should be considered in evaluating the situation. I reiterate that the practice of law in and of itself is not prohibited by law. Assistant Attorney General blah, 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 prepared the foregoing, which I hereby approve. Hold on. I'm interested in this. The doctrine, this is an opinion. The doctrine also provides general guidelines for avoiding an inappropriate situation. In particular, it indicates that a public employee should avoid participating in discussions that would affect his personal interests. This principle is also reflected in the state ethics and contracting laws. Accordingly, the common law doctrine of conflict of interest should be considered in evaluating the situation. Interesting, ain't it? That they go into such a discussion about the practice of law. Now, here's the thing. 
for all of you to have some idea, 1982, 1991, and 2004, what these courts have said is that since they appoint these officers, pay attention, since they appoint these officers who work for the attorney general, they are out of the attorney general's office, the court says is that they make them officers in order to practice law before them. Sorry, you can't do that. Attorney General's office is the executive branch. You got separation of powers. One to one powers. Separate. Okay. You have separation of powers. You have to separate those powers. You cannot practice with the same powers. That's what they've been doing. They cannot do that. Now, see, the reason why they don't want to address the issue of whether it's a right or a privilege, yeah, everybody has the right to practice law because the law is available to all public members. So any member of the public who is subjected to those laws has the right to know those laws and to practice defending themselves and their neighbor because we have sworn our lives and our fortunes. Do you not understand the Declaration of Independence? Sorry, that's the reason why I did this video because again, we we're gonna be, I'm gonna be updating these laws here, but I'm putting this information in here so that those people who pull it up from now on will have this new information. This will be a further and in-depth uh, presentation of law. Now, the one thing that I'm going to do mostly is update the jurisdiction section. Okay. It has a habeas corpus section. I will probably update the habeas corpus section, but I am definitely more concerned with the jurisdiction section. Sorry, I have this uh, program on my, it's called Titan Player. And I have it on my cell phone and it just sprung up. All right. When a person is not a licensee, neither the agency or an official has any jurisdiction over said person to consider an order. One of the grounds of want to jurisdiction was the accused. Now we're going to take this statement right here. I want just this statement. Copy. And that's what I'm going to put in now. Because we're going to do want to jurisdiction. Because we're going to add this to that section. Case text, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very grateful to case text. I do not have an account with K-Text, case text, but I will go ahead and give case text the same as I give the artists that I play in music, same as I give them um, credit. I'm definitely going to give case text credit. One of the grounds as to jurisdiction was the petitioner was not at the time of the proceeding a licensed contractor and was not claimed, it was not claimed that he was. Now, who is this? The Department of Professional and Vocational Standards. Such recommendations from the first, the petitioner objected to any proceedings upon the grounds from the first. He objected to their jurisdiction upon the grounds that there was no jurisdiction, therefore, and he offered no evidence, although he answered question, um, he answered questions put to him by the supervisor. One of the grounds for jurisdiction was that he wasn't licensed, his license had expired, and he had not asked for it to be renewed. Another ground was that the whole matter was the subject of a pending lawsuit in which the complainant, plaintiffs, and petitioner defendant. Petitioner alleges. Now, I'm interested in this because I'm interested to see what they decided. And this is California. And California is a very stupid state when it comes to its appeals court and their decisions because they often do not follow their own rules. They often use technicalities in order to get around reality. Yes, I said it because, okay, the judgment of Superior Court is reversed with directions to a, a judge and decree that an order be made to the register of contractors be declared null and void for lack of jurisdiction. So he won. He challenged the jurisdiction saying he did not have a license. The same thing, you do the same thing with driver's license. This individual won in California. These idiots knew that I did not have a driver's license and yet <laughs> they gave me a ticket. Well, no, they didn't give me a ticket. Sorry. They gave me a charge of driving without a license without ever pulling me over. Without ever having this issue argued, they did the best they can to keep this off the record. And I'm saying, I don't think so. We're not going to play that game. Gus, we're not going to play that game, G. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we're including this in jurisdiction, and I promise you the document will be long, 
we're letting you know that these are the case laws that says that if you are not licensed, if you don't have a driver's license, if you don't have that application on file, they have no jurisdiction over you. That's what these cases are saying. Go over them, review them. That's why we have the laws that you did not know existed. I'm going to do that right there. And I'm going to, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to make them a little bit smaller. Save some space. So I'll put them at number eight. And we're going to, yeah, we're going to paste them the same way that they are. Okay. So those are those laws right there. Now, I'm going to keep the site at nine times and all that in there. Okay. Because, again, you need to be a license. See, the plaintiff has failed to state that a claim or cause of action against the defendant. Why? Because he didn't have a license. You must be licensed. So if you're driving with a suspended license, you get, look, you don't let the license be suspended. You have to let the license expire. Suspended means you're still under that jurisdiction. So you have to let it expire. Or if it's suspended, then you have to go ahead and revoke the license. You have to go ahead and give them back their junk and you have to void out that contract that you have with them. You have to give them notification that you no longer wish to contract with them regarding this. Tell them that you believe that there's been a breach of that agreement, but you cannot just let the license um, be suspended because you failed to do this or you failed to do that. You, you can't chicken out. That's basically what that amounts to. Watch this. Yeah, we're going to do the voluntary subscription, the license one, because that's necessary. Absolute. Ladies and gentlemen, I will put this up. It won't be today. Sorry, I'm just, I'm doing too much. As a matter of fact, I just let one auxiliary battery run dry. And now I got to plug in a different auxiliary battery so that I can uh, be able to get through this day because I'll be in front of this computer for the next five hours. And these auxiliary batteries do come in handy because they can handle those five hours. So I am reaching behind me, turning on the other auxiliary battery. And while I'm talking to you, right down here, it shows that it's charging. From the other auxiliary battery then i'm going to remove the battery from the computer because i don't want to deplete the auxiliary battery faster i'm going to run just off of the auxiliary power for now but again absent allegations of any specific purposeful act through which the defendant could be said to have sought a benefit sought a benefit by availing itself of jurisdiction, by availing itself of the jurisdiction. Evidence that the defendant was a non-resident is sufficient to meet its burden. Non-resident? Yeah. Evidence because it says all basis of personal jurisdiction alleged by the plaintiff, absent allegations of any specific purposeful act through which the defendant is said to have been, to have sought the benefit of availing itself of the jurisdiction, evidence that the defendant is a non-resident is sufficient to meet its burden. What burden? Let's go ahead and find out because I'm interested to find out what burden they're talking about because that doesn't give me enough, okay? This is a 2010 case. So I am interested, we'll go here to this one. Okay, Jim Wickler, Wickert appealed the trial court's order granting year one incorporated special appearance and dismissing with prejudice Wilkert's claim against year one. In a single issue, Wilkert claimed that the trial court erred because it had both general and specific jurisdiction over year one. We affirm. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. I believe the argument here is uh, specific, specific, la, la, la. Whether the court had personal jurisdiction over a non-resident defendant is a question of law that often requires a resolution of factual issues. Okay, so 
when in this case the trial court does not issue findings of facts and conclusion of law to support its ruling on a special appearance, we will imply that the trial court found all facts necessary to support the judgment that are supported by the evidence. Why would you do that? If the trial court failed to put those that evidence on the record and it was brought up and somebody challenged it, then you cannot insinuate nor can you imply that the trial court found that evidence but this is what they do all the time see the plaintiff bears the initial burden of pleading sufficient allegations to invoke the provisions of the long-arm statute to determine whether the plaintiff has satisfied his pleading burden and determine the basis for jurisdiction alleged by the plaintiff the court considered the allegation of the plaintiff's petition as well as its response to the defendant's special appearance except as noted above upon filing of a special appearance the non-resident defendant assumes the burden of navigating all basis for personal jurisdiction alleged by the plaintiff in other words he didn't challenge their jurisdiction in the initial pleading absent allegations any specific purposeful act through which the defendant can said to have been sought a benefit of availing itself of jurisdiction evidence that the defendant was a non-resident sufficient to meet its burden in his third amended petition he alleged he and has the uh, Texas resident, blah, blah, blah. See, he did not challenge their jurisdiction over his person, but he did submit a pleading. Because he did that in its special, appe uh, special appearance, Georgia Corporation is not a resident of Texas. Year one also asserted no grounds to establish that either general or specific jurisdiction over year one. Okay, I don't know if they raised this in their first pleading, and I'm not going to. In support of his special appearance, this individual vice president of marketing and finance of year one filed an affidavit testifying that he has personal knowledge of the facts in his affidavit and that they are true and correct. He also testifies that year one is a Georgia corporation and is not a resident of Texas. And the remainder of Halsam's affidavit supports year one's assertion that no grounds exist for general or specific appearance over year one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I now understand what's going on here. This Wickert's individual failed to demonstrate how they, under the long arm statute, conducted business with him in this state. And if he had done that, he would have satisfied the jurisdictional issue. But he did not do that. He did not establish jurisdiction. When you file a complaint, you must establish jurisdiction. It is the burden is on you. And the court is saying they failed to do that. That's why they affirm the trial court's granting of year one special appearance. Okay, because their special appearance was to challenge the jurisdiction. See, did not plead sufficient jurisdictional facts to bring year one within the provisions of Texas Lawmark statute. See, again, it took me a second to realize what was going on here. I get the case. It's exactly what I said. Okay, fine. But that's because the person who brought the suit didn't know that you must, the first thing you must do is you must establish jurisdiction. You must show how the court has jurisdiction. That's why the prosecution often does that. However, when we're challenging jurisdiction, because we know that that's what they're going to do on a normal basis, what we're going to do, pay attention, everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to challenge the jurisdiction over us being a natural person, that we're not the named party. Doesn't matter if my name is similar. You must now prove that that's me. That's not me. That is the name of my estate. And here's the proof that that's the name of my estate. Okay, I'm not going to show them a driver's license with all cast name. I'm not going to show them a birth certificate. That doesn't prove that, that proves that there's an existence of the estate, but that doesn't prove that's the name of my estate. But I'm going to prove that. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I prove, I'm proving the license. But you know what? This does not bring up the license. Okay, it's impossible to put a central nexus with the state, such as voluntary license. Okay. Okay, we get rid of that part because they're focusing on the first part. I want to focus on a license. And if you notice, none of those spoke about license, except for the other case that we went over. So for the next one, I want to see... I don't see license. Asserted allegations. 
They keep talking availing itself of the jurisdiction. I don't care about the availing oneself of the jurisdiction. That's and they all say the same thing. That's why the paragraph is exactly the same. Exactly the same. I don't want that one. Exactly the same. So they're all repeating the same phrase. They're copying and pasting the very same law. Or excuse me, very same opinion. Okay. I'm now they're they're focusing on a substantial nexus. All right, and uh, resident of the state jump. I don't want the long arm statute. I want the substantial nexus, the state nexus, and we're going to get rid of state, and we're going to put that right there because I need to narrow it down. Because again, I'm looking for license. Hey. Cable network news network CNN. Uh, going relationship entity, don't see license. Uh, subscriber subscription involves, and these are civil cases. So, okay, merely being a paying subscriber is insufficient to establish a special relationship. Don't care about that. Okay, even absent a formal licensing agreement, a sufficient licensing relationship may nonetheless be found by solely upon the status of affiliation between the owner of the trademark and the national organization and the user of the trademark and local chapter organization for the organization. Okay, it's licensing element. The aspect of arrangement uh, must be coupled with the community interest between the parties and therefore described before abuse of potential note still not pulling up the actual law so that's not helping us so that was a waste of my time looking up the absent substantial nexus to voluntary subscription to license let's do voluntary subscription to license ah the query is is too short voluntary subscription to license Look at that. It said the query is too short. Let's see. Because it's not two words. Look at that. Four words. Um, examples of voluntary license in a sentence. I don't want an example of voluntary license in, in a sentence. No. I'm not looking for definition. Let me see. Okay, voluntary license of patents. A voluntary license is an arrangement whereby a patent holder may allow others to, to manufacture, import, or distribute its patents and drugs. Ladies and gentlemen, when you voluntary subscription a license with a Department of Motor Vehicles, they have the patent on that license. They own it. That's why their seal is on it. And they give you permission to use that license under certain terms and conditions. Okay? That's what we're looking for. Yay! Acceptance. The formal voluntary act of agreeing to an offer. Arbitration clause. A clause in a licensing contract that calls for the parties to blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm going to pull this right here because I could use this. This coming from one of them schools, them universities. All right. But again, this video is showing how we're going to update the laws you did not know exist. Periodically, we'll be adding more. But we're going to take care of the jurisdictional issues first. So that should be up sometime within the next few days. Have a good day, everybody. Don't want this video to be more than 30 minutes long. Got to go. Goodbye.